What's going on, lads and lassies? Ken McAuliffe here, the Jazz Vinyl Lover, back with one of my... It's rocking back and forth thing. It's not going to cut it. Um, something I've done before called 5x5 five five Favorite Jazz LPs, and that's what I thought I'd do today. Talk to you about just pull them out of my wall here and see what my favorite five are for today, starting with Ralph Towner on ECM Solstice from 1977. ECM pressings are great. Um, they're kind of ignored. <laughs> And you can find them, I think, in uh, major urban centers. Uh, beautiful recordings, Manfred Eicher, the German label. Um, uh, this is Towner with Jan Garbarek on saxophone, Eberhard Weber on bass, and John Christensen on drums. John Christensen, kind of the white Swedish version of Jack DeJanet. You can see all their photos there. And since Garbarek is on there, you know it's going to go a little out at times. Ralph Towner is one of the great guitarists, period jazz, classical, rock, whatever. He's just one of the great guitarists. He's almost 90 years old now. He just played in New York City. I didn't see him. But um, extremely lyrical, a great touch, very imaginative. This uh, record, Solstice, from 1977, are all originals. And in a way, it kind of typifies the ECM sound, which is very airy, kind of ethereal, but also at times when they start to improvise, somewhat aggressive and, you know, going for it. Uh, I can't say enough about the players on this record, particularly Eberhard Weber, who just passed a while ago, one of the great upright bass players, John Christensen, one of my heroes as a drummer, who plays on hundreds of ECM recordings, I guess, as well as other uh, odd recordings, and Towner, um, who always plays the acoustic guitar, you can see him there, in sort of a classical setup with his bell bottoms on there, uh, just a, a lyrical, beautiful guitarist. Uh, I would buy any Ralph Towner around my found uh, and if you if you're just getting into ECM that's probably a good place to start there's no middle ground with ECM perhaps the first couple Pat Metheny records um, Bright Size Life and I forgot the name of the other one but that Manfred Eicher sound is always there Manfred Eicher the producer and the founder of ECM is involved in every session even to this day and I still think ECM makes wonderful records uh, even though many of them are border on classical uh, they have some of the some of the great modern uh, musicians, Todd Gor Tord Gustafsson, I can't remember all their names, but many Swedish and European players. Next we'll go to the great Milt Jackson from 1956, Jacksonville. Uh, in his own way, uh, similar to Ralph Towner, uh, Milt Jackson, vibraphonist, never played a bad note. He was a member of the MJQ, for my money, the only good thing about the MJQ, because I found them to be very boring and extremely white and cocktail jazz, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, Milt Jackson can fit into any situation and improve it. Um, beautiful solos, great taste, always upbeat, always ambitious, always uh, just very concise. This, he made a number of records on Savoy. As I said, this is from 1956. Where are my notes? This is a mono Rudy Van Gelder pressing. There's the mono, the maroon Savoy label. And you know, there's just something about these old records, you know, the, the laminated covers. Look at that. Isn't that beautiful? I mean, that would be a high-res photo by today's standards. You know, and that was done old school, cut and paste. This record has a wonderful lineup. Milt Jackson, Lucky Thompson, another great sort of forgotten tenor player, one of the early masters coming out of Coleman Hawkins, but very lyrical in his own way. Hank Jones on piano. Wendell Marshall on bass, I don't know much about Wendell Marshall, and the great Kenny Clark on drums, one of the great innovators of the drums, Kluk, as they called him. If you ever see, there's a Kenny Clark album with Hank Jones, I forgot the bass player, maybe Wendell Marshall, very hard record to find, um, just the three of them. Uh, it's a beautiful trio record on Savoy. They cover, this record is primarily covers of Ellington tunes in a sentimental mood, mood indigo, as you were, which I'd never heard of before. Um, and a couple uh, Jackson compositions, Minor Conception, Solo in 3-4, and Charlie Parker's Bebop Standard, Now's the Time. Uh, this is just a solid, you know, post-Bebop, not quite hard bop. You know, whatever Mill Jackson did was just always really, really stellar. And in that same bag from 1962, Bags Meets Wes, the great Wes Montgomery. Uh, when I've interviewed great guitar players through the years, and I've had the privilege to interview Pat Metheny many times, and John Schofield, and 
a couple times, Bill Frizzell. Wes Montgomery is the man they all cite. You know, he played with a thumb. He, uh, I think he invented chordal soloing. Uh, just one of the great guitar players, died young. I think he was a uh, plumber. And he had the Montgomery Brothers with uh, Monk Montgomery. I forgot the other guy's name. But uh, this is a stellar meeting between these two amazing players on the Riverside label. I don't know if this is an original pressing or a second pressing. This has definitely been reissued. It's been reissued on CD with additional tracks. Came out on SECD, which I still have. Super audio compact disc, uh, which was a great format that failed. But, um, you know, this is just in the pocket. One of the funny things about this record is you have Mill Jackson, melodic player. You have West Montgomery, melodic player. And you have Wynton Kelly. You know, usually... Like, I interviewed John Schofield for his latest record, and that's one of the first times he has a piano player, Gerald, Gerald Clayton, on his record, because usually melodic players don't want people to get in their way. But here you have three melodic players, and they're, they're hand in glove. Um, what do they cover here? Mill Jackson tune, Benny Golson, uh, Blue Raz at Montgomery tune, another uh, Mill Jackson tune, Sam Sack, Jingles by West Montgomery. And this is not a blowing section. You know, everyone talks about Blue Note and how they rehearsed a lot. Uh, I don't know what happened to Riverside, but this record is, is, is extremely tight. These are really cool arrangements. Um, I don't know uh, what configuration has been released on vinyl afterwards. You know, you can go to Discogs, D-I-S-C-O-G-S dot com. That will show you all the years for any record just about. Uh, the original release, the matrix numbers, the following releases, reissues from each country. Discogs is a great site. Um, Continuing onward, uh, in that 60s, 60s vein, with the great Horace Parlin, the pianist, with the trio, Us Three, from 1960. Um, this is the first pressing, I believe, not that it really matters, 47 West 63rd, I don't know if you can see that, it looks like you can't, uh, deep groove, P, yada, yada, yada. Um, Horace Parlin is unusual. And that, you know, sometimes he's a uh, just kind of a standards kind of Hank Jones sort of player. Other times he's a little more ambitious. And on this record with these really hip, sparse arrangements that are really surprising for a Blue Note record from this period. Uh, other times he's more, you know, of a soul groove, but not like a, a Lee Morgan. More coming out of church, I guess, and gospel music. He bores some people. I think he's great. He didn't make that many records for Blue Note. He did go on to make, I think, a series of records for Steeplechase. This is a hard record to find. Horace Parlin, George Tucker, and the great Al Howard on drums, who also played a lot with uh, Shirley Scott, I believe. Uh, just a really solid piano trio record. Um, you know, if you want to find, you know, most people think of piano trio, they go to Bill Evans. That's much farther removed from this. This is more, I don't want to call it grits and gravy, but it's more in the pocket, it's more soulful, it's more about the swing and not as much about Bill Evans and his introspection and all that. Um, you know, this is, I wouldn't call this like a Three Sounds record, it's slightly more abstract than that. Once again, Horace Parlin was an unusual player. He, uh, I think he could have gone anywhere. He was like kind of advanced and sophisticated, yet also really connected to gospel and the church. Finally, one of my favorite records, I have a little story behind this record, George Duke's The Orwell Prevail, his sixth record. 1975 on, on the great German label MPS, but I don't think this rec was recorded in the Black Forest as were most MPS records. It's got that great psychedelic cover. I've never really looked at it before, but it's kind of freaky, right? Um, MPS made so many great records. They're still reissuing them. They found that one the Residents put out a couple years ago by that piano player, Bill Evans. Um, this is all about the funk. 1975 you know, George Duke, I believe, got his start playing piano with Sarah Vaughan. So he's, you know, thoroughly grounded in jazz. Then he went with Frank Zappa on Overnight Sensation, Inca Rhodes. He might be on uh, just another band from L.A. And Zappa introduced him to synthesizers. And he went nuts. And this album has Rhodes, Wurlitzer, Clavinet, Arp Odyssey, um, Arp String Ensemble, a Moog bass, different Mutron phase machines. And the great lineup of Ndugu Chancellor on drums, who just died a couple months ago. The great Alfonso Johnson on bass. Who else is on here? There you can see the cool cats and the kids, and there's George. Um, but a great lineup. 
uh, Air Toan Percussion, Sylvia St. James, Kathy Whirl, and G. Jansen Vocals. Uh, you know, I love this record. Um, I first heard of this back when I was doing an interview with the drummer Kenny Wallison, who plays a lot with Bill Frizzell. And Kenny lives on 72nd Street at the river, at the end towards the river. And he lives in this old mansion that was once, I believe, owned by George Gershwin. Um, and it's, you know, four, it was a four story mansion turned into a uh, small apartments. And I remember going to visit him there. And there was like a homeless guy sleeping in the vestibule. Uh, this was in the 90s, I guess. Um, but Kenny had this record and he had two copies, so he gave me one. This is all about funk, a lot of Brazilian influence. The record really floats, great drumming, uh, very uh, cosmic in a way, but still very grounded because George Duke was always about the funk. You know, this is long before he went on to have uh, bigger hits with Brazilian Love Affair, and I think he collaborated. I love his record with the Billy Cobb uh, Live Mother for You. And uh, I think he's on one other one, but um, MPS recently reissued all five of his records uh, and they cover the span from this kind of freaky stuff to more uh, soulful records. Um, and I'm always, when you see one of his records, they're worth grabbing because they're really funky and he's a great player. Thanks for checking in. Ken McAuliffe, Jazz Vinyl Lover. Please read my stuff in Stereophile and Downbeat and Jazz Times. Join our Jazz Vinyl Lovers group on Facebook. I'm on Instagram as Ken McAuliffe, the Jazz Vinyl Lover. And uh, please, if you feel like it, hit that, hit that subscribe button, and I'll keep bringing you more of these fabulous videos every day. Okay, everybody, have a great time. Bye.